Today my talk is going to be very historical and so I'm hoping to be able to uh, lay down a little bit of some historical uh, ideas on censorship in Hong Kong and the history of censorship uh, and how everything has kind of led up to the emergence of the classification system. And so um, as we know by now, the term Category 3 film was actually derived uh, from the classification system that came out of uh, 1980, uh, 1988. So that was the new classification system from Hong Kong that replaced the censorship system that had been in place. Um, actually, some historians would trace back to 1888. And so... Um, and so the as film historian uh, Christoph van den Torst actually argues uh, Hong Kong censorship and also later on the declassification system has always been politically motivated. So politics is always the number one concern and also, the, also racially segregated. And nowadays, I think Carolyn would talk a little bit about that issue is still, still persists nowadays. It's not racially segregated, but maybe regionally segregated. And so, um, so my uh, focus today is, as I, as I said, to introduce the history of co colonial censorship in Hong Kong since 1888. Um, and, and the idea is to demonstrate how filmmakers and also spectators, spectators have a role in it, to kind of turn a very negative environment, a censorship environment, into a kind of cinematic experience and also cinematic practice that is very subversive, like very exciting, and also a kind of public sphere where very conflicting and contesting political opinions, values, and ideas get negotiated. And in some ways, the spectators' anxieties about the government authority and the kind of political power was also getting mediated as a result. And so as uh, Kenny Ng and also Du Ying, like two very, very major scholars uh, in uh, film historians uh, who work in Hong Kong and Beijing uh, separately, and colonial censorship of the entertainment industry actually began as early as 1888. But the first censorship law was not really aiming at cinema. It was actually uh, 1888 because, because the cinema, the cinematograph, has not been invented. But it was actually a racial segregation law. So the idea was that, um, first of all, it limited the residency of all Chinese residents of Hong Kong to areas outside the central area. So that's number one. And second of all, also to put all Chinese residents under curfew. And so people couldn't really move around. Now, it really ended, ended up having a really strong impact on the entertainment industry and eventually the film industry. Because in the 1870s, there were a lot of Cantonese theaters, Cantonese opera houses that were proliferated, proliferated in the 1870s because Hong Kong was colonized and so a lot of trades were taking place in Hong Kong. And so people from the north and uh, would come to Hong Kong to kind of open up, they needed entertainment. So they, there were lots of tea houses. And so um, the col colonial government actually complained that the Hong Kong uh, Cantonese opera houses were too noisy. And so they basically banned all Chinese music performances and also banned all staged entertainment um, of uh, Chinese performances. And later on, Chinese motion pictures to be screened in the central area. And so they had to be licensed. And it's a really interesting thing because licensing uh, for Annette Kuhn, um, films, the film scholar Annette Kuhn actually points out licensing was a very interesting uh, policy because licensing was effectively forcing the Chinese theater owners to pay a rent to the government in order to operate in their own premises. And so, so basically Annette Kuhn said that the, the very original idea of censorship was a, an economical sanction of Chinese theater owners. And so um, another thing was that not only that he had to pay a rent, but the police force at that time, um, there was no Chinese participation in the police force. So basically they were primarily white police officers or South Asian police officers. They were sent frequently to the Chinese theaters to kind of like fine and also arrest people. Um, again, 
for behaviors that frankly are quite human. <laughs> and so sometimes there might be an argument, they, there might be a fight, uh, but they would be uh, complained and also arrested for those issues. Now, um, many of us here would probably know better than I do, the idea is that uh, around 1905 to 1907, around the world, um, the, in the United States, definitely there was uh, a Nickelodeon boom. And so a lot, and also in Europe, there was also, were also kind of tiny little movie theaters uh, springing up. And so as a result of that, a lot of middle-class people would look at the cinema as a kind of uh, bourgeois entertainment, uh, sorry, a, a kind of working class entertainment. So it, it's a kind of hotbed for criminals. And so as a result of that, um, the, uh, a lot of uh, middle class owners began to, investors began to invest money into building uh, movie theaters that were aiming for a middle class audience. And so as a result of that, uh, the film, in, basically film production also became very, very profitable because you now need a lot of movies and also big budget movies in order to support the audience demand. As a result of that, in Hong Kong, there was no industry, like it's a really arguable thing. The idea is that there was no industry as the way we understand in Hollywood, but there was actually a very active filmmaking community. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of business people from South Asia and also Southeast Asia, who, uh, where there were like uh, British colonies or other European colonies, like Indonesia, um, um, the Philippines, and also the uh, British Malaya, would go to Hong Kong and invest money to build movie theaters for uh, a primarily white audience and, and actually show European films and American films. Now, as a reaction to it, um, the government basically um, passed a new law called the Theater Regulation Ordinance in 1908, and so starting to impose license fee for these new theaters. They were primarily in the Central District. Whereas um, in 1910, however, the Legislative Council took away, basically, they basically excluded um, Chinese language theaters from the law, and it was a really interesting move. So the result of it is actually really interesting. The um, 1908 ordinance, the newer ordinance, would be responsible for taking licensing fees from white dominated theaters. Whereas the older 1888 Chinese ordinance would be responsible for, for policing the films and also going in to police the audience. And so censorship became, became politically driven, but also very, very um, targeted, particularly for racial segregation. A very interesting thing, however, is that a lot of filmmakers decided to answer that kind of censorship by using two strategies. One of them is vulgarity, to make very vulgar art. Um, the other thing is localism. Uh, the two things are very, very interconnected, and I will tell you a little bit why and how. And so the idea is that um, in the night, if we really fast forward a little bit, in the 19, up until the 1920s, a lot of Hong Kong films were actually, there was, of course, there, was no, there were no feature films. I mean, around the world, feature film was still very new. And so there was a very well-established Cantonese opera industry. And so the uh, opera performers would be asked to go and perform, a, for, perform an act, like a short act, and they would record a phonograph of their singing with the act. And so they would be played sometimes in Hong Kong, sometimes in the Malaya, sometimes even in Europe. And so the idea is, is that uh, they would be, it would be really connected to the theater industry. But besides doing serious, um, serious theaters, but also uh, serious dramas or even like high, uh, more elevated um, comedies, they also do some very racy and also morally subversive comedic skits. So these comedic skits are very, very highly, highly problematic. They would use very vulgar Cantonese language. And so yesterday in Sex and Zen, there were kind of like imprints of some of these things. So for example, um, in one case, 
uh, during one of the castration scenes, um, if, you, if those of you who were here, during one scene, for example, the doctor was supposed to operate on the main character uh, to give him a bigger dick. And so the idea is that uh, during that scene, they keep using the vulgar version of dick in every single sentence. And in Cantonese, gone none. So, so basically, there are many, many things that keep adding these vulgar things. People laugh, people have a kind of shared sensibility that, hey, I understand that vulgarity. And it's cool, it's really okay. And so the idea is that some of these sex films were even combined with nude striptease. Uh, and also tableau vivant, and some, sometimes they would have, uh, there is a thing called the X-ray show, and so the idea is that they would have a backlight from the, from the back, and so you would have a stripper uh, standing in front of, the, uh, of, a, of a backlight and then slowly strip it. They call it the X-ray experience. And so, um, and then they would show pornographic films and also Swedish pornographic films as well. It was really fun. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes they were done for birthday parties and, and, and so on. Um, and so um, when the colonial uh, authority looked at these works, they were like, well, this is just being Cantonese. They are, they are by definition degenerate and vulgar anyway. We don't really, I mean, this is okay, we don't care. So it facilitated these films to be able to be produced even as early as the 1920s. And then, but at the same time, we also need to understand a cultural difference because um, in Victorian England, I mean, or Edwardian England at that time, of course, I mean, sex acts, I mean, who do, who do that and, or, or who do that in public. And so the idea is that um, Giovanni Vitiello and also Deborah Sang actually pointed out that in urban trading ports like Hong Kong and Shanghai and, Hong, uh, and also Suzhou, a lot of these places, the idea is that um, it's one thing to have reproductive sex to maintain a family, and they are supposed to be following some kind of social order. But on the other hand, um, it is also permissible to talk a lot about, um, to talk about and put into practice non-reproductive sex. So they are supposed to be leisure. And so these are not forbidden topics. They are human nature. And so you just, you're supposed to talk about them, appreciate them, have fun with them, and so, so the idea was that, um, so that cultural difference also allowed these filmmakers to make use of the space as a kind of resistance. So basically, a lot of these sex jokes were also coded with political messages, even like yesterday, Sex and Zen, even though it wasn't made in the 1920s, they also put in political messages, right? When the servant was being threatened, I mean, um, the doctor was trying to, cut the servant's dick off and like in replace of the main protagonist um, dick and so the servant is just, I am a human being, like I have human rights and the doctor would be like, no, you don't really have any human rights because you're Chinese. And so, um, so basically a lot of these political messages are being worked into the vulgarity of the work. And so, um, and of course, if there were different waves of censorship policies being implemented during the first half of the 20th century. But I want to really fast forward to what happened in the second half of the 20th century. So um, 1945 to 1950, it was a really, really, really dramatic transformation. In 1949, the People's Republic of China was established in Beijing. And um, the UK government actually recognized the PRC government as the legitimate government. The Korean War started in 1950. The United States actually recognized the nationalist government who was recently moved to Taipei as the legitimate Chinese government. So there is an oh shit, oh cool situation. And so the idea was that, um, the, but the, Beijing government was not, uh, was actually quite anti-British. And so they actually started sponsoring the anti-British liberation war in British Malaya. And so that really threatened the entire British economy. And so the CIA actually persuaded Whitehall, the London government, to tighten its control over um, communism, communist activities in Hong Kong, and at the same time keeping a kind of uh, diplomatic uh, friendship with Beijing. And so meanwhile, the Beijing government also wanted to leave Hong Kong open. 
And so they had no administrative rights over the territory. So as a result of that, they also suggested communist activists at the time to stay put and not to do anything. And so the Hong Kong government's main target in, in any kind of film censorship was about, first of all, to discourage Hong Kong's sedition, sedition from the UK, but also banned any film that would offend the Chinese government. So it's a two, it's almost sounds like an oxymoron. The films can't offend the UK, it also can't offend the uh, Chinese government. And, and both governments held really, really op opposite uh, political points of view. And the situation became even more complicated in 1967 with the leftist riots. The leftist riots were, were inspired by the Cultural Revolution in mainland China. And then also there were some protests that happened in 1966 in Hong Kong and also in Macau. And so on the 6th of May 1967, there was a strike in, a, in an artificial flower factory. And that strike was being used by other unions and also by some bureaucrats who were representing the PRC in Hong Kong to kind of start a whole series of protests, industrial actions, and so forth. The whole uh, riots actually subsided in December 19. 60, uh, in 1967 in December, when Premier Zhou Enlai issued a, an injunction. They basically expressly said that the government, the Beijing government, does not support the uh, 1967 riots. Um, and so it was a really brutal event. Both sides, the police and also the protesters, used a lot of acts of violence. And, and basically it resulted in 51 deaths and also 832 people getting permanently injured. And then also 4,979 uh, 4, arrests uh, with close to 2,000 people getting convicted. And so um, one thing that I raised in my second book called Extraterritoriality is that when we're thinking about Hong Kong, one thing we need to remember is that the sovereign authority over Hong Kong has been historically arranged in a way that it would be in the hands of the Chinese government. But the administrative rights are in, were in the hands of the British government. And so we, I actually call it a kind of double occupancy. The idea is that as Hong Kongers, I mean, I grew up in Hong Kong, so I would still call myself as, as a Hong Konger. As Hong Kongers, we often find, find ourselves doubly occupied by two totally conflicting political powers. These two political powers kept claiming that you're mine, you're mine, I'm gonna make decisions for you. And at the same time, they ostracize us from the larger political community. So for example, in 1982, the UK government took away the citizens, British citizenship from Hong Kongers. Nowadays, Hong Kongers are not qualified to get a Chinese passport because we would be considered Chinese subjects but not Chinese citizens. And so a lot of these things, um, the, and, and at that point one thing to think about is that the governor of the time, David Trench, was really nervous about media and he firmly believed that media could potentially incite Hong Kongers to develop a kind of independent subjectivity and agency from both the UK and China. That was the danger they were, they were worrying about. And so, so on March um, 1968, David Trench was really thinking about the possibility of rolling out a much more serious uh, film censorship program, but it was rejected by Whitehall at the time <coughs> um, as a kind of too top-down policy. But the new generation had sprung up, and many of these uh, new generations of filmmakers uh, may, they were born in uh, mainland China or they were born in Hong Kong and many of them went to Hong Kong when they were still three years old, five years old. So Hong Kong was their home. And so in, 19, in the 1950s and 1960s, many of these writers uh, wrote for this particular magazine called the uh, Chinese Students Weekly. It was actually sponsored directly by the CIA. Um, and then in the 1970s, a lot of these critics also started a new <coughs> film magazine called, the, called Close Up. And they also put together a film club called the Phoenix Film Club 
to make their own films independently. Um, one major debate was that they began to question, is Chinese cinema a term that is appropriate to talk about Hong Kong cinema? Is Chinese language cinema even an appropriate term <coughs> if Cantonese is the primary language for the cinema? And, um, and could we even identify ourselves with the nation? And so one idea is that there was an awareness of Hong Kong's extraterritorial position, not only politically, but also uh, culturally and linguistically. They were also demanding the use of many innovative film forms. Um, they were looking at European and American new cinemas and new waves, uh, other Asian countries, um, experimental arts, to kind of try to use new film forms to, um, to kind of give Hong Kongers a voice, especially women and also uh, socially marginalized people. And so the idea is that um, there were many, many famous uh, directors who started to uh, do this kind of experiment on television. So the first, uh, so including some really big filmmakers that many of you are familiar with, for example, Patrick Tam made a television series called Seven Women. He used a lot of very innovative film forms uh, to kind of talk about women's sexuality and subjectivity. Um, Johnny Mac, who produced <laughs> Sex and Sin, <laughs> actually started out uh, to uh, do a cop show uh, called CID, and he used a, a lot of almost like documentary filmmaking, cinema verite, uh, that kind of work to uh, talk about police corruption. And even a, the government television station called Radio Television Hong Kong ended up um, rolling out a television series called Below the Line Rock and used uh, kitchen sink realism to talk about poverty and um, uh, migrant workers and those kind of issues. And of course, there are experimental filmmakers like Mok Tiu who actually would talk about uh, in the 1970s, what does it mean by a leftist in the 1970s when the uh, society became a lot more consumerist oriented. And so um, in 1977, however, something started to boil in the kind of history of censorship. Um, <clears throat> Macau, which is, a which is a neighboring city of Hong Kong, at that time it was under Portuguese administration. And so Macau actually adopted a po new Portuguese uh, film classification system in Macau, and so there was no longer any kind of like overt censorship. And so the first film that they tested out that was to screen the unedited version of the last Tango in Paris. And so a lot of, uh, so the Association of Hong Kong Kowloon Free Business, uh, Businesses uh, petitioned the government to replace the current censorship system. But bear in mind that the, uh, the, the censorship bureau at that time, the censorship office at that time, was really seeing the cinema as a mass medium. So in other words, what they wanted to see is that, yeah, I mean, the current censorship system seems to be okay with us because on the one hand, there is over 18, so that's fair enough. If you make a pornographic film or violent film, it's always over 18. If you want to make a film that is uh, watchable for everyone, then you need to kind of, quote unquote, um, promote the kind of public moral standard. So that was actually the government's position on it. But the government, what the government actually did during the 1980s was the opposite. So the idea was that they were not really interested in anything about sex, uh, sex and sex, they were like not really interested in anything about sex and violence per se. They were a lot more interested in banning films that, were, that would be offending the mainland Chinese government. So it included uh, Wang Tong's If I Were For Real and also Bai Ting Rei the uh, coldest winter in Peking. And so both of them were Taiwan made, you can say yes, a kind of like capitalist propaganda film against uh, communist China. And at the same time, some directors in Hong Kong began to challenge the kind of quote unquote public moral standards, um, including for example, David Lai's um, Lonely 15, which was about uh, underage uh, sex workers. And um, it, once, upon a, once, upon in, uh, once Upon a Rainbow, which was actually about, again, premarital teenage sex, and then um, later on also Teenage Dreamers, they were all in 1982. They were trying to challenge the public standard, but because they knew that there was a censorship system 
So all three films ended in a very, very, very disappointing way. They ended up telling the, the, peop, uh, the spectators that, oh, all these sex workers eventually got back to their parents and became good girls. And so, um, and so in some ways, the film, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of film critics actually started to complain that isn't the censorship system doing a lot, doing a little bit too much, because it is actually censoring the creative process. And this creative process is not gender neutral. It's actually specifically censoring how women are being represented in the cinema. And so, um, so basically, um, in 1982, uh, Patrick Tam's Nomad um, contains a scene like this. And so this actually originally was passed by the censors. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to show you the entire scene, but you can see that. Um, so the whole scene is really about the two protagonists um, making out. So, um, so um, for some reason, I can't really um, fast forward it for you. Um, and there was some PowerPoint issue. But you can basically, what, what going, what's going to happen in the scene is going to get racy and racy and racy. And so, um, so basically, it triggered the uh, teachers' union at that time to complain that, uh, to actually demount the film censorship office, to actually pull that film out from release in order to censor them. And so this scene was being cut. Interestingly, another scene uh, played by Leslie Jung um, I'm not going to play for you, but the scene is actually cut in a way that is much more conforming to the kind of softcore pornographic film, was much less discussed. And some of the people would say that, um, yes, because the Leslie Jung scene actually follows the generic convention of the film industry, whereas the, tra the tram scene is framed in a way that there is a voyeur and we are actually uh, lining ourselves up with foyer, and to and because of that, the spectators, meaning we, when we're watching the film, we become strongly identified with voyeur, and we become hypersensitive to our position as a voyeur, wanting to see this, wanting to ban it, and wanting to interfere, and not being able to interfere. So a lot of these, uh, so basically, this film became really controversial, and. Um, and so, and it really triggered a whole debate on um, exactly what the government censorship is doing beyond uh, checking whether a film is politically kosher for the PRC. And so on the 17th and the 25th of March, 1986, the Hong Kong government actually, um, the, uh, the Wall Street Journal Asia, uh, finally published two articles. And these two articles basically proclaimed that the Hong Kong government has been exercising censorship with no constitutional or legal framework. And so this issue was being um, raised by politicians as well as by um, other people, um, by filmmakers, and say that, well, I think the government needs to look at it. But the government's initial uh, response was that, well, I mean, yeah, there was no constitutional framework Frankly, we have been aware of it since 1972, but it sounds like the public wanted it, so we never intervened. And so, um, and so basically, the Miu Fong, one of the film critics, really complained that this whole problem really started with the very fact that um, the Hong Kong government was a technocracy. A lot of business people were holding the political power and so they were much more interested in the business and also much more interested in the stability of the, film, of the film industry and the whole social system than situations like what does it mean by human rights, what does it mean by women's rights, and what does it mean by creative uh, freedom. And so in May 1987, finally the classification came out. It is the classification that we're familiar with, which is like category one and two and three, but at the same time, if we look closely to the classification system 
um, the idea is that the government infrastructure and the possibility of using it for political censorship is still very much alive. And you can definitely see that um, in, um, in the appropriation of the system as recently as last year by the People's Republic of China to use the exact same system to actually repurpose it for political censorship. So um, I would say to, this is a final note. Um, the very final note is that sometimes, um, I love category three film, but sometimes the idea is that sometimes I call it, uh, watching a film has a kind of pleasure that sometimes I, am, I would relate to a sense of constructed failure. When I say it's not failure, it's not a negative thing in this case, it's constructive. It's something that is really powerful. It's the failure to precisely cross a number of boundaries that the spectators would want these films to cross, either political, either social, either sexual, either gender. Um, in a way, the Category 3 film has transferred the pressure of censoring images from the censorship office to every single individual body of the spectator. Oh, I'm now allowed to see it, but I am now responsible for censoring it to see, oh, this, this is good for me, this is not good for me. And the government is still kind of um, imposing that standard by inculcating that standard in our body, by putting that into our body. But, I, I, but again, as Yao Jing would argue, the self-knowingness and naughtiness and subversiveness of many Category 3, three films precisely remind us of their political disempowerment. And the fact that the government still determines what can or cannot be said, seen or heard. And so as a result, uh, once again, last year, this censorship system was once again being appropriated by the Beijing government to as a kind of political censorship. And so we can see how that power can be given back to us as spectators and then withdrawn back to the government and to exercise what we are allowed to see, what kind of sex we are allowed to practice, what kind of infuriating affect, and sometimes maybe justifiable violence or non-justifiable violence that we are supposed to be able to negotiate as a community. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so I will start at the beginning, uh, Victor told everything that came before uh, Category 3. Um, and when Category 3 arrived, it is not a genre in itself. It was meant to be for local filmmakers and producers uh, to be able to show movies that were either problematic because of their political content or the sexual content before. Uh, Victor showed a picture of a film called If I Were for real, which was banned in the early 80s. And thanks to the Category 3 rating, this movie was, be, was um, able to be screened in, uh, after uh, the new uh, three-tier uh, um, category system. Um, so the, at first, what you were able to see is many movies that were problematic before, like uh, La Dernière, The Last, Sorry, I don't know the, the English title. La Dernière Tentation du Christ, uh, which will never have been able to be screened before that rating. Uh, Nagisa Oshima in the realm of the census was shown in 1988, and it was not shown during its original release because it was not possible. But soon, for local producers, it was, they realized that well, we can show art house film, we can show political films, but hey, maybe we can show some other stuff. Maybe we can go into more violent stuff, more sexual stuff. And then what started as a, a, a way to show art house films, political film, very quickly turned into exploitation movies. And the very first movie to be Classified 3 is very interesting because it is both a very political film and a, a, a pure exploitation film. It is a film you probably uh, know, which is Men Beyond the Sun, which was made by a Taiwanese director called Moon Tenfei, um, who 
who made the very first film about the Count uh, 731, which was made during World War II by the Japanese in Manchuria to make experiments on uh, Chinese people. The thing is, the Japanese government denies, still denies to this day, the existence of this camp. And uh, Mu was really uh, willing to make a movie about what was a, a big problem at the time because Japanese government uh, uh, historical books in Japan refused to recognize the reality of this event. So he made this movie, uh, Made Beyond the Sun. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it is a very factual film about what happened. And the problem is it is a little bit too factual because it really shows what happened there. And it's ultra violent, ultra gore. Uh, it is a, a movie which has caused a lot of problems worldwide with censorship, even in Ireland, in Germany. Uh, when it was shown, I think it was 10 or 15 years ago in Paris during a, a film festival, there was a lot of critics toward the film because people call it threat exploitation. And it is because when you're dealing with a subject like that, you're supposed to take a very mild way. You're supposed to show uh, not direct horror, but Mu wanted to show what really happened because he wanted to shock people. He wanted people to realize what happened. And this film is somehow very symptomatic of the whole category three genre. Um, and very quickly, you had some uh, unique genre that emerge from the, 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 this new rating system. And like last night was Sex and Zen, you had all those movies in uh, sex in costume films. And Sex and Zen was probably the, the most well known. You got uh, the, the, the first one that you saw last night, the two, the three, 3D, and then other. There was even a TV series, Sex and Zen. Um, you got other films like erotic. Um, Sex and Zen was, was based on a, a, a classical book called Yu Piu Tsuen, which was, there was already uh, an film adaptation of that film by Orphan. Uh, Victor showed a quick um, a picture of one of Orphan. Orphan is one of the, the, the most famous film directors in terms of erotic movies, very sophisticated films. He was himself a photographer, so he, he has a very keen eyes for beautiful design. Uh, but Sex and Zen was very something over the top compared to what uh, Orphan made in the 80s. And you had erotic ghost story. Erotic ghost story was sex and zen plus Chinese ghost story mixed into one film. And it was a very <coughs> big success. You had erotic ghost story one, two, three. Um, just a quick um, scene from erotic ghost story to, to, to tell you how much over the top the film was. You got Anthony Wong, which is an actor you will see in a lot of film during the, this festival. He's going to be in a Taxi Hunter tonight. He's the one in Ebola Syndrome, in a The Untold Story. He was the bad guy for a lot, for, for many years, probably because he was, um, that's why he, he told me that, because he was part Guelo. Uh, he was part Hong Konger and uh, part uh, European. So for, for local filmmakers, he was the perfect bad guy because he was not a pure Chinese or pure Hong Konger. So he, he was always cast in the bad, uh, as, as the bad guy. And in Sex and Zen 2, is a demon. And then what part in this movie is um, having sex with, uh, with another demon. And he has sex so strong that he cut uh, this uh, female demon in, in half, but he still keep on, <laughs> on having sex with part of the corpse. I mean, it was so over the top. Nobody else was doing that at the time all over the world. You had maybe only anime in Japan, uh, for those who were, who were Urutsu Kudoji. Uh, this was the kind of stuff you could see, but it was only in animation. And, Hong Kong filmmakers were doing that for, for, for real in live movie. It was, it was simply crazy. Um, and then you are still in, in this subgenre of uh, costume sex. There was a Chinese torture chamber story, which was sex and zen plus uh, tortures 
which were basically inspired by those Japanese exploitation movies from the 70s, especially the one from Teoru Oshi. We made a lot of uh, exploitation films uh, where you get women sexually abused and tortured. And well, that's what happened in those films, uh, which were produced by Wong Jing. Wong Jing, who was, and probably still is, one of the most um, commercial-minded producers in Hong Kong and who had very keen eyes for what uh, the audience wanted to see and what would become popular with, with them. And indeed, he had hits after hits after hits in every genre pop possible. Gambling movies, category three movies. Um, <clears throat> you probably need one, one of his most famous uh, Category three movies is a Naked Killer with Xing Mi Yo. Xing Mi Yo was his girlfriend at the time, but not officially because he had already a wife, but everybody knew in the film industry that it was his her mistress. And he wanted to kind of make her a big star. So he put her on, on front of this movie and she became uh, in a matter of weeks, one of the biggest stars in Hong Kong. And the, the poster was very famous because you could see her, her from, from the back with a very uh, short short. Um, and this film is, is very symptomatic of all the, the Wong Jing way uh, in approaching exploitation films. You had beautiful actresses, a lot of actions, um, some sex, not too much, for, for that particular um, genre, uh, a little bit of lesbianism. And well, it, it was a success. The film was released uh, on video in, in Spain, in Italy, in the UK, uh, in US, even in France. Uh, sometimes some parts were cut, uh, but most of the time it was shown um, in its war form. Regarding cuts, it was not because there was a new rating system that films were shown without any problems. Uh, in 1993, there were more than 500 films being categori categorized, sorry, categorized three uh, being screened uh, that year. And on, on those more than 500 films, 402 were cut uh, because of violence, because of sex. So it's not because the, the, that particular rating came that censorship stopped. And despite what we tend to think about Hong Kong films, censorship toward violence has always existed, even in the 60s when Cheng Che was doing his uh, wuxia and his new uh, kung fu movies. Many of them were cut. So we tend to think that violence has never been a problem in Hong Kong, but it has been for, for many years, and sex as well. So <clears throat> many films have uh, encountered troubles, um, like Art Boyd, which was one of the last great John Woo films. There's more than five minutes, which has been cut by the, the, the censorship. Uh, Dr. Lamb. Uh, the untold story has been cut and uh, there's still no way to see the uncut version of those films. There's so many of those. And I happen to discuss with a lot of uh, either film producers or filmmakers in Hong Kong and they tell me that they have really no power whatsoever on the, on the release of the film. Sometimes they could show some more explicit scene because they knew some people in the board and there was some kind of um, beyond the desk talk okay i'm gonna cut a little bit of that but please will you allow five minutes of more gore and sometimes it did work because they had some kind of familiarity uh, so one of filmmaker told me that they often have lunch uh, with some of those people at the board to try to soften uh, borders, to manage to get uh, more things shown uh, in theaters. But sometimes they didn't know because the board was always changing. They didn't have the, the same people uh, always. So sometimes they didn't have any way to, to manage to get the film released as they wanted to. Um, apart from sex, so, and you had obviously the more reg regular erotic films, and there's tons of them. Uh, there was a new way of ultra-violent movies, and 
Billy Tong is one of the most famous directors uh, who made those films. He made Run and Kill, Red to Kill, and Dr. Lamb, even though for Dr. Lamb, uh, is not credited as the, 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 the lead director, but he was the one really directing that movie. Um, what is very interesting about those films is the level of violence that was shown in them was really something that had never been made before. There was a very violent film made in the 60s and 70s, but there has always been something very operatic, very uh, uh, beautiful about them. But with category three, they tend to go for a, a violence which was not fun at all. I mean, when you go for Ebola syndrome, there's a lot of fun scene in it. But you had a really darker side uh, of violent film, of ultra-violent film, and the film that Billy Tang made are very symptomatic of all that, that particular current. Um, and you had the true crimes uh, films, and there was a new wave of true crimes films. Um, there was already during the 70s, the, the, the Shaw Brothers studio made a lot of films based on, based on uh, either political, uh, no, uh, police investigation movies, uh, crime that it happened. There was a series of films called C Criminals, which was short films put together uh, dealing with uh, a particular event that shocked the, the, the colony at the time. But during the 80s, the, that kind of thing disappeared and they really appeared again uh, after the Category 3 rating. And there was some very interesting film because I believe that um, you can understand more about a particular society, not looking at what you can do or what you can show, but what you cannot do or what you cannot show. And those films were, were very interesting. Um, there's a film called uh, Suburb Murders. Suburb Murders were, were, was based on the, the, the killing of two young English uh, teenagers <coughs> in Hong Kong. Um, they were like the, the, the perfect teenagers. They were loved, they were beautiful, uh, they were rich, and they were killed by three young uh, Odlum uh, Hong Kongers. And it, it <laughs> did shock profoundly the, the society. But the thing that was very unique about that particular event is that teenager being killed in Hong Kong is not something new. But usually it's Hong Kongers being killed. And the thing is, who cares? That the colonial uh, government didn't care for yet another 15 years old being killed during a triad fight. Who cares? It's just one in thousand for years. But then two British citizens being killed in Hong Kong, that was not possible. And it was the biggest manhunt ever created in Hong Kong. There was uh, a, a, a thousand and thousand of uh, um, uh, what was the money in, in uh, British pounds? <laughs> Sorry, there was thousand and pounds uh, Hong Kong dollars uh, spent to, to 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 try to catch those uh, the, the, the the killers. And the, the, this particular movie is really interesting because it is very low budget. It was not very shown very, very, very long at the theater, but it, it really show a side of Hong Kong society that you are not permitted, that you are not used to see uh, usually because it really show the police work and why it was such a, a, a huge hunt only because it was uh, two British citizens being killed in Hong Kong. And it is very, f very interesting. But you had movies based on true crimes that was just simply crazy. There was a spike drink gang. At one point in Hong Kong, you had people that were buying drinks in a supermarket, coming out of the supermarket, and then they realized that they'd been robbed. And there were more and more cases. And so the, the, people, the, the police start to look at it. And what they found is that <clears throat> a, a, a gang of young teenagers spiked the drink with uh, a particular type of, uh, it's not a poison, but something that drives people uh, dizzy. And they didn't realize after that they've been uh, stolen all their money. And it was not 
a big case. I mean, it's, it's something pretty anecdotal. But then a filmmaker decided, well, there's some, we can do a movie about that. And they decided to do a movie, but what can you do about just people getting dizzy and get, getting them on a stall? There's not really basis to make a movie. So he decided to put more sex in it. So people were dizzy, but then they get raped, which was not true at all. And they were killed, which was not true at all. But you got those bases. Uh, those true basis at, uh, uh, at the core of the film. Uh, it was just simply crazy. And you got some older movie, more like suburb murders, like There's a Secret in My Soup, There's a Secret in My Soup, a movie from 2001, uh, which pretty much shocked the, the, the Hong Kong population when they, they discovered in a huge ball the, the, um, the skull of a human being, and it was found that it, it was a girl that was uh, being kept captive because she didn't want to do some stuff, and she was made into prostitution, then was, she was killed and then cut in pieces, and she, they keep the, the, the skull in a, in a soup, in a soup bowl, and then they decided to make a film about uh, that particular event. What was very interesting about that movie is that it was very, very factual about everything that happened, about all the history of, of that particular girl. And it was very, uh, a, a very hard movie to watch because you see everything that happened to her during the, the weeks before this. So it's not a pleasant movie. Uh, there was another dealing with a, a, a a very violent case at the time. There was the Tune Moon Rapist. Tune Moon is, um, is a part in Hong Kong in the Northern Territories, which is very working class, uh, with a lot of uh, low income uh, buildings, and which is not really a, a nice place to live. I can say that, Victor. Yeah, it's not, it's not the, the, the best uh, place in Hong Kong to live. And there was a rapist there, uh, which start working, excuse me, the, the, the expression, we start uh, raping women, one, two, three, four, five, six, and nobody cares, the police didn't care about it because it was a working class area and it, it, the police didn't really want it to get involved in what was going on then. But then there was one woman killed, so at one point the police asked to really start working there. And the, 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 the film based on that fact was called The Rapist, and um, he told about the, the man hunt. And what was very interesting about that, that, that particular character, the, the, the rapist himself, he was very close to the one you see in the film Dr. Lamb. Uh, they both had the same family name, but they were not part of the same family, but it, it's quite strange, they were called Lamb both of them. Uh, they were all uh, lonely character living by themselves. They were really outcast in a, in a society where family is very important and they didn't really have close tie with the family. They were living on the side. And, and The Rapist is a very interesting film on that matter because it, it gives you a view of Hong Kong that you are not used to see uh, usually in movies. And without the category three system, such a film would not have been possible to be made and to be shown. Um, those movies, sex and ultra violent movies, being uh, forbidden to, to, to minors, this is somehow quite classical. You can see that in Belgium, you can see that with the S rating system in Spain, uh, interdit au moins de 18 ans en France. It is quite classical. But then you had some very unique reason to forbid films to minors, like movies dealing with black magic. Uh, there was a, a subgenre of movies dealing with that. Black magic is something Many people in Hong Kong, especially with the older generation, still believe in uh, particular magical uh, practices. And black ma magic, many people believe in black magic. And there was uh, uh, films since the, the 70s, there have been quite a few films dealing with that. But there has always been a problem with censorship because the censorship in Hong Kong was not really at ease with um, superstitions. 
and category three managed to make those uh, superstitious films uh, able to be made and to be shown again. And you had crazy movies like Devil of Rape. Devil of Rape is a movie where you get this um, typical Hong Konger who want to be like top of the class in terms of uh, sexual um, proveness. Um, so he goes to see this uh, magic doctor and he, ma he managed to get just by his spirit, he managed to get orgasm to all the female he can encounter. But of course, it gets worse and worse and just getting sex by his mind is not enough, so he starts killing people. I mean, it's a crazy movie, a typical exploitation category through movies. You got Eternal Evil of Asia with uh, Elvis Choi. Elvis Choi, you saw him last night in Sex and Zen, is the bald guy. He's a very talented actor, but someone he got typecasted tip casted as the, 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 the bad guy in so many uh, exploitation films. But if you look at Long Arm of the Law, he's someone who can do many more stuff. He's a very good actor, but unfortunately for him, he made mostly exploitation films. And in Eternal Evil of Asia, it's a typical story of Hong Kong people going to, um, uh, to vacation in Thailand. And as you know, if you watch a lot of movies, of Hong Kong movies, going to vacation in Thailand is a bad idea. You're gonna come back with trouble. You're gonna come back with uh, sex disease. You're gonna come back uh, with part of your family killed, or you're gonna come back with a curse on you. And the, the curse coming from Thailand is something that being used in so many categories. Three. And Eternal Evil of Asia is typical. You got this uh, group of Hong Kongers going there, uh, getting uh, sex with a Thailand woman, who obviously is very easy because as every know, everybody knows in Hong Kong, Thailand women are easy. That's what they say in an exploitation film, of course. But the girls get killed, and the trouble is, his big brother, Elvis Choice, was a master of black magic. So he gets revenge on them, and the film is just crazy, over the top. Um, and this is really something quite unique. And you, you had all those general like movies dealing with triads. Triads is a very problematic subject too in uh, Hong Kong society. Many films have been banned before. One of the very first films to show triads in a realistic way was uh, The Tea House in the 70s. But there have been really few. And thanks to the category three, there was a lot made, especially I want to talk just about one, which was called Secret Signs, uh, which was made by Dick So in 1992, which was one of the very first movie to go deep and to make a lot of research about the way the, the, the triad works, the signs they use. And what was really interesting about that movie, it was produced by Jim Choi, Jim Choi, who was himself a real triad. Uh, <clears throat> who deal with drugs. I can say that now because he's dead, so. Uh, and he got killed during the shooting of that movie. Uh, nobody knows if there's a connection with the movie or not, but I think it's more to do with his bad habit with drugs. Uh, but what is interesting is that you got all these exploitation movies on one side, but you had another side of category three that we tend to forget is socio-political films, uh, films dealing with homosexuality and art house movie. Homosexuality has been a big problem with the, the film industry for many years. And when Wong Kar Wai uh, knew that the end over was coming, he wanted to make a movie about two guys falling in love, and it, it was 1997, he knew that it was the, his last chance to do it. And he made Happy Together, and Happy Together is not an exploitation film. There's no hardcore scene in it. There's just one love scene at the beginning, uh, which is not more uh, shocking that you can see in a lot of heterosexual movie, but it was a, a love scene between two men, and just that particular scene made that movie forbidden to minors. Um, you had many, like Victor say, curse words are, uh, have been problematic for many years. And you got movies that are 
just straight movies without any sex, without any violence, but with a lot of curse words that get forbidden to mariners. Uh, Stephen Shaw, who is the biggest star in Hong Kong, who has been for, for many years, got one of his movies forbidden to mariners just because he was cursing all the time during the movie. But there's no violence in it. There's no sex in it. He's just saying, well, Cantonese is very rich in terms of uh, vulgarity, but basically it's just saying fuck, 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 fuck all the time, and it's just for being dead because, because of that. I mean, it's quite surprising. And he got a lot of art house movie. Uh, I just want to talk about last one, which is Autumn, Autumn Moon, which is a beautiful movie made by Clara Lau about uh, a Japanese spending some vacation in Hong Kong and meeting a young girl and a, a, a grandmother. And there's simply no reason to forbid that to me. No, why? Because there's two love scenes in the film, but those particular love scenes are not exploitation scenes. They're very important in the development of the story. If you take them out, you, you, you miss something uh, in the film. And it's quite surprising to see the, the, the world of Category 3 mixing together ultra-violent movie, art house movie, uh, homosexual movie without any exploitation in it. So next time you, you look, uh, you, you, you find either a Laserdisc, a DVD or the Blu-ray with uh, the triangle and three in it. Don't think that you will see uh, an exploitation film because maybe you're gonna buy an art house film and I know some people were sometimes disappointed because they, they bought because of that they say my god this is an arty film yes you get many art film being classified three thank you very much I think Julien you said something very interesting which was you can often tell a lot about a place from what's not allowed. So my question to both of you is, what can we tell about Hong Kong from what isn't allowed? As, Hong Kong is a very complex society because it's historically part of China, with a Chinese uh, inheritance, but it has been uh, profoundly and deeply uh, um, influenced by England and more globally by Europe and it, ha it has a very unique uh, perspective on, 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 on everyday life compared to, to, to mainland China and you can see the, the, the film that have been made in uh, Hong Kong since the, the, the 60s probably even earlier are very unique to this society and what was made in Shanghai and what was made in, in um, in Hong Kong in the 60s and 70s and so on is so different that you realize that maybe people have the same in heritage but they develop very uh, drastically differently in Hong Kong and Hong Kong to me sh should be uh, this is not my, my, my place to say that especially with a really true Hong Kong area but Hong Kong should be a, a, an independent state it is not really uh, part of China, it is not obviously part of England. Uh, it has a unique identity, and I, I think the, the, the best way people could live their life there would be to be totally autonomous. I find um, the ideas that are the. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I find, I find that um, I really, I'm really grateful for Julian saying, um, like, first of all, during the, uh, your presentation, there's one point I do want to bring it out again. Um, LGBTQI plus films have been uh, still systematically suppressed. And yes, I mean, nowadays there are films, like there are trans films um, that are not necessarily being uh, suppressed that way. Like Tracy was able to appeal to um, a kind of a lower age audience. But there is, but the whole concept, and I have told Ross that the first category film, three film I saw, ironically, wasn't any ex exploitation films or any violent films. It was just because it's a gay love story and I really wanted to see it. And, and so Derek Jarman's films were systematically, uh, even experimental films about LGBTQI plus issues. I think that's number one issue. The second issue is I also have to say that 
under the national security law, um, the we are talking about tons of independent filmmakers who are making films that may not even be touching upon political issues. Of course, in the spirit of 1968 uh, Paris, everything is political. But the idea is that um, the idea is that there are many extremely talented independent filmmakers um, in Hong Kong, many women filmmakers in Hong Kong, who are now struggling to get their voices heard. And I know that this is um, under the Xi Jinping's government. Of course, it may not. It, I'm not saying that this is only unique to Hong Kong. Mainland China has also tons of talented filmmakers who are now making films and not getting hurt inside that place. And really in a really bad way because of internet control, uh, we are now even having trouble getting some of these films being um, shown even on online platform in London or any other places. So it's a, re it's a really critical situation. And, um, and I think the idea is that I think the idea is that um, these films, you, you never know when the line is being crossed um, among filmmakers. So I think we are talking about category three films, at least <laughs> there was a line. And there's, there's no longer a line in terms of like what can be said or what cannot be said. Oh, if I may, there was a document. It's not about feature films, it's about documentary too. There was a documentary made a few years ago called Woman's Part, which was a, a very feminist film uh, about life of women in Hong Kong. And it, it's not an exploitation film, it's just a straightforward documentary. And it was categorized three because it gave for, for once women the opportunity to talk about their everyday life, uh, everything from family and sexuality. And it's quite uh, shocking to see such an important piece of work being forbidden to, 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 to minors, but I think it's very symptomatic of the way uh, the, 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 the film censorship works in, in Hong Kong, especially after 1997, after the end over. Any, any questions? I'm, I'm actually from Hong Kong, so uh, uh, I thank you for being so sympathetic to, to Hong Kong, whether Hong Kong should be independent or not. But I, uh, it's not the topic. Uh, but at least it, it should be granted more freedom. Um, but uh, actually the topic, uh, as someone from there, actually, I, I was quite conservative when I was younger. So actually, I saw, saw them as, uh, should I see those films or not, you know? But I did see uh, The Lover, for example. Uh, uh, I was quite surprised that it is sort of a, a, sort of a set of cult movie, uh, films, and so phenomenal. So my question is, why Hong Kong? And is there somewhere else? Um, I think, Hong Kong with those uh, Forbidden to Minos film, uh, it was really the, the last wave of exploitation f movies that the world has known so far, maybe in the future, I don't know. But the, 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 the real last wave of exploitation films were in the 70s and early 80s in Italy, uh, the US, uh, Spain, a little bit in France too, but it basically dies by the mid 80s, there was no exploitation movement. And then suddenly, at the, the end of the 1980s in Hong Kong, there was this explosion of movies really there going where no one dare go. And even in Italy, during those crazy days in the 70s, nobody was making movies like those Hong Kongers were doing. And I think. I wrote a book about Category 3. What I, I try to, to, to say is that Category 3 happened during two, two particular dates, the 1989 Tiananmen Massacre and the 1997 Andover. And to me, it's very symptomatic to, to put all those movies into that particular context because it was a very stressful time in Hong Kong. Uh, people start to realize that 
Well, 1919, 19, the, the, the Tiananmen massacre, maybe we're going to leave that in a few years. There's going to be the end over. And I feel that all that tension, all that anger, and all that frustration was being made into the screen. And you can feel it in really hundreds of movies. And it, it was really typical of that time. That was, that I, I think, I feel this is why those films were made at that particular time, and it was unique uh, in terms of history and time. Thank you. Um, I think a couple of things I absolutely agree with uh, Julien's uh, evaluation, because it was a very stressful time in the 80s. Um, I was still in Hong Kong in the 80s, and um, it was, I mean, I mean, I think from a very anecdotal point of view, um, in the early 1980s, when the UK government was having a talk, were having talks with the Chinese government over Hong Kong's uh, future, I remember that um, every day you go to the television and uh, some high politicians from either side would say, oh, our talk was really constructive and <laughs> useful and constructive. And it's just like, Every day you, you would just look at the television. Sorry, if I use a Cantonese swear word, it's like the <laughs> It's just like what? It's, it means fuck. It's just like, like our lives are going to be affected by these people and we have no agency over it. We have no choice. I went to the National Archive and looked at the documents from that time. Edward Yud, who was actually a very conscientious politician and sinologist, and when he was being asked, uh, when we, he was being asked by Whitehall, uh, Mackie Thatcher actually asked, well, by the way, there are public opinions saying that uh, Hong Kongers, like regular Hong Kongers should be given a voice. Edward Yu, of all people who are really sympathetic to Hong Kongers said, this is a diplomatic, not democratic issue. And so, um, and you feel the same way over and over again. And the kind of pressure that you don't know, when, when um, that power society came up with Capre Diem, that particular idea really struck a note. It's like, what can we do? There is no future. When, when Wong Kar Wai's film came out and say, uh, Takeshi Kaneshiro's character, right? Everything has an expiration date. We always said that, like I remember even in my diary, it's just like 1st of July, 1997, that's my expiration date. I don't know what my life is going to be. And so, so there is that kind of pressure going on. And, um, and the idea of, um, and in, in actually one of my book chapters I also talk about, it, I really want to read your book, because it's the idea that um, in the 80s and early 90s, there was this kaleidoscopic media. It's like these category three films and the predecessors, a lot of times were made out of these, every day you have, um, I remember that there'll be three new films being released in Hong Kong, and you can go to the cinema and watch tons of films, 90, sec 90 minutes per, per film, and you have these pageant, um, like beauty pageants like Miss Hong Kong or Miss Asia, and, and sometimes, and, and the kind of media ecology was really fascinating because a Miss Hong Kong is now born and she has, for example, big breasts. And so, so now you have six big breast films like from, <laughs> Sex and Zen was actually one of them, right? And so the idea is that you, you have this fascination. It provides a kind of amazing fascination. You can go to a restaurant, have your dim sum, have your tea and look at, oh my God, big breast films, like six big breast films. <laughs> and, and so this is kind of like a, it really both takes away your anxiety, but at the same time channel that anxiety into these castration fantasies, like uh, human rights uh, anxieties, all of these things are being channeled to those things. Um, but not to keep rambling, but just a final, like a quick, 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 quick note to that is also in comparison um, let's not forget that Japan still has a uh, censorship system that was implemented in 1945. And so, uh, so in comparison to other countries um, in the same region, ironically, the Hong Kong standard was actually quite progressive at the time. I mean, not now. Um, South Korea was still having like, heavy censorship. So you can see how that shifted when the censorship systems changed, also in those neighboring countries. Yeah. Any other 
question. Um, did this movie, especially the extreme ones, have an influence on other Asian movies? Do you want? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I would say. Uh, Korean cinema, definitely, new Korean cinema, um, and a lot of Korean films, um, artists, even actors, and they were really, I mean, they just admire a lot of these films. Hollywood films, so even Hollywood films. Japanese films, even when we we're talking about Takeshi Miike, uh, the idea is that in the early years, especially, even he would say, hey, like, Hong Kong directors somehow get away with doing these films. It's a, it's a kind of roundabout history because as Julianne has really pointed out, we could see Japanese, uh, Japanese exploitation films in the 60s and 70s and these Hong Kong filmmakers somehow brought that up to a new level. And then when the Japanese and uh, Korean filmmakers saw them and they were like, wow, they really get away with these images. And then they, were, they had a bigger budget. I mean, Korean filmmakers later on had bigger budgets and then Japanese filmmakers, of course, historically they have bigger budgets. And so they were able to kind of bring that to a, uh, to, to a kind of more mainstream, internationally welcoming level. Um, so definitely, even nowadays, if you go to Udine, Far East Film Festival and look at and talk to some of these directors, they would still kind of look at the category three films and like, wow, these, these were the films I, well, if I didn't grow up with because I was a child, like, they would be like, well, I would as aspire to be able to make some versions of them. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I also would like to say about the Philippines too. The Philippine film industry is very big and there has always been a lot of Hong Kong movies being screened there and I know quite a few filmmakers were inspired by them and tried to do their own shocking movies based on those category two movies. I believe in Thailand too, they try to go a little bit higher regarding gore after all those category three films. So yeah, they had a big international impact, definitely. Um, I have a question about uh, the idea of constructive failure, uh, as you, as Victor mentioned in the last slide. And um, I was wondering to, ex to what extent does it still can this be still applied to the politically censored movie that we, that we were experiencing at our times? And um, if there's a certain kind of transgression in these politically censored movies, it is certainly not the transgressions of pleasure, but, um, but because these movies are more about the powerlessness, uh, suffering, the frustration of the, of the, or the so-called failure of movement. And um, yeah, so my question is about um, how do I understand the, the constructive, in the constructive failure, if this uh, idea still applies and if there's a transgression, what kind of transgression it will be? Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. <laughs> um, first of all, I would say uh, the constructive failure notion, I think it was, uh, I meant it to be historically applied to category three films. I mean, the kind of transgression when we are watching those films and frankly, when we're watching category three films even now, I think there is still that sense of transgression because some of these pressures um, from the government, from the society at large um, have not gone away and some of them actually come back. And so, so that's one level. On the other level, I think you may be, um, you may be referring to, for example, like documentary, like Hong Zhangping, the ideas that documentaries about, uh, about uh, movements, the 2019 movement and also 2014 umbrella movement. Um, I actually would say that, I, I would say that first of all, it's, it, you're absolutely right, it's not a, a failure of, of pleasure. It's an actual political, I wouldn't necessarily call it failure or not failure. But I think if you begin to say that, okay, um, because I, I think I did write about the fact that it's less so after 2019, but in 2000, after 2014, there was a sense of like, okay, we, did, we do need to, a lot of these filmmakers and the, uh, and the subjects being interviewed may acknowledge that, oh yeah, I mean, we need to acknowledge that there is a level of failure, at least on the performance level, meaning that 
the movement got shut down by the police. And so, so the idea is that the constructiveness of having this memory, re-examining this memory is extremely important. And I think there are two, on one level, the idea is that there is, a, that there is one type of documentaries about the umbrella movement that was primarily on location, documenting what was going on. They were released very quickly on a digital platform. So those were about documenting, disseminating, like making people know what is going on around the world. On the other hand, there is another type of documentaries that came out between 2014 and 2019, which really focus a lot on re-examination or, or, or what sometimes Henri Bergson would actually call a kind of attentive memory. The idea is that the event is over, at least on the performance level, and so in what way we understand how this memory was imprinted in our bodies, how those memories are being negotiated by our human process of revision, rethinking, reevaluating, and reconfiguring. And so I think that process is it's really constructive and it's extremely important. And I think nowadays, to the, after 2019 movement, we are also seeing a new set of fiction films and documentaries made by Hong Kong filmmakers who reflect upon the 2019 process, like Tan Zi Wun's. Um, Blue Island is a really good example. So the idea is that, okay, it's about time. We can think of, we can put a 1967 leftist rioters with someone who is waiting for their trial now together, put them together in a, stand, in, in a prison cell in Stanley, which used to be used by the colonial government to imprison leftist rioters. Two generations of fighters who have totally different beliefs. The 67ers wanted a Chinese takeover, wanted a communist regime. The, 19, the 2019 people wanted independence. And so how do you put these two people together and really begin to establish a dialogue and mutual understanding, sometimes not even on an intellectual level, but on an affective level. What kind of frustration and anger and desire uh, is everyone trying to negotiate? And so I think these films are really constructive in, in those terms. Thank you. Any final questions? We've got time for just one last question. One question is, uh, Julian mentioned that a lot of female directors, right? Uh, you mentioned that there are, or there were. But um, from what I saw, uh, I didn't see a lot of women's names, maybe except uh, the gray hair one uh, that was among your slides. Maybe you, uh, you, can, you would like to comment a, a bit on it. And the other thing is, as, 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 uh, as you said, uh, you start one question, maybe. It's more minor because you, you, you started already. Uh, with the national security law imposed on us by men in China from outside our legal system and outside our law, actually, they can do anything without the category three for political firms. Direct censorship. Uh, well, before that, or, or, or after that, 10 years, and now it's revolution of our times. So what will happen to those films? <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> regarding female filmmakers, uh, uh, the problem is not unique to Hong Kong. It, it's a reality worldwide. It's more difficult for female in general to to, to, to make movies, uh, it's a reality. R regarding category three, you had much more actresses who became known because there was a lot of erotic films and they needed female actresses. But there was r really only a, a few behind the camera and those who were behind the camera were generally on the art house 
type of movies like Cla Clara Lowe. Uh, I, I think one of an Oi movie was categorized three, two. So they were really, all the, the, the female directors were not really involved in the exploitation side of category three. They were more on the art house side of category three. Um, regarding the movies now, <laughs> I will let you. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, as I said, the Hong Kong um, independent filmmaking the Hong Kong independent filmmaking um, opportunities, uh, I mean, people are still making a lot of independent films, but opportunities like this, the idea of like getting together in a screening room to be able to watch independent films in Hong Kong is no longer possible. And now I'm not saying that, I mean, of course, there's still golden scene cinema, which actually shows uh, more closure in independent films that have already got permits, but getting a permit is not everything. We also need to remember, I mean, I uh, used to collaborate with the Chinese Festival Festival for 10 years. Last year it was shut down. Um, we were doing it in London of all places, but uh, the Chinese embassy actually asked all the filmmakers to withdraw their films and they have all got permits. So it's, it's not like we were showing the revolution of our time. Um, uh, now we're showing revolution of our time this year, but, but the idea is that um, some of these films, I think, um, we, are, we are going through a process that mainland Chinese independent filmmakers have gone through around 2008, 2009 with the Olympics crackdown. Um, and so the idea is that um, we are facing a, a little bit more of a, even more difficult situation was that the mainland crackdown in 2008 to 2009 and into the 2010s, there was still a sense that as long as you show these films, ship these films out to um, Europe or to North America, uh, no, one is still, no one is going to bother you that much. But now you are feeling, you, you're feeling the pressure because uh, when the NSL national security law was passed, um, I was actually told uh, by some um, friends, it's just like, watch out because you're, you're, you're working in London, you're British, and so people, like, you're going to be under watch. Um, and the moment I arrived in, in Brussels, um, I noticed that my Google, uh, my, my Google search engine was switched to um, mainland Chinese over and over again. And, um, and I, I actually talked to Google and Google said, oh, like it sounds like you locked in in London yesterday in the afternoon. And I said, I didn't. And so, so apparently someone was creating a parallel stream to, to figure out what I'm doing. And so the idea is that um, you begin to feel that the pressure is being extended in many different ways. Um, there are, I mean, in London, there is going to be a film festival that showcases independent films um, from Hong Kong, both political and non-political films, and it's going to take place in a couple of weeks. And so forums that are outside of Hong Kong, and do think that uh, a place like this is really precious. So the idea is that cinephiles, people love the cinema, people love to know what's really going on around the world can continue to watch these films and support these filmmakers. And it's, it's really important because I think, especially when we're talking about the fact that many Chinese independent, we're talking about 20 years ago, Chinese independent films, uh, Jia Zhangke and all those people, they were really excellent. They were making really interesting films. By now they are asking for 1,000 euros or 2,000 euros or even 5,000 euros per screening. Um, and it has really created a, an impossible situation for, for them, but they don't care right now. And, um, but there is a bunch of filmmakers who are making really, really, really high quality films. They have a lot to say and they, they, they would be very happy to get 100 euros <laughs> or even less or, or even no money to actually get their voices across. Um, and so I think, as you said, what will happen to these films? I think all of us are, are scratching our heads to see what support system we can offer 
from abroad. What support system they can continue to do is not always about abroad. It's about how they can continue to make films in Hong Kong and for Hong Kongers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to have a very short break in a moment and then we'll come back and we'll watch Callum's documentary about uh, the Category 3 films. Um, so I just want to say a final thank you to our two speakers, Victor and Julian. Uh, and also, personally, I want to say thank you to all of you for coming out because I know, given what's happened with COVID, you know, we all desperately wanted to come back out, but some of us, understandably, are still kind of nervous about being back in public. So thank you for, for all of you for, for coming and engaging in actually what once again shows that the kind of cinema that we love here that we watch here can be fun can be irreverent can be silly but also can be really serious and can give us a kind of window into some really really important and very serious issues so thank you all and we'll take a short break and then we'll come back with the screening